every night. Let us drink and drink one down. In a quiet corner of Denmark lies a plastic fantasy world of perfection. Legoland. It's a national icon that's gone global. There are now 62 Lego bricks for every person on the planet. Small, clever and prosperous, Legoland neatly mirrors Denmark's self-image. Even here, climate change casts a shadow. But also on display are the Danes' clean green energy solutions. Wonderful, wonderful Out in the real world, the Danes are now going global with another icon. Denmark has become the world leader in wind power technology. With just five and a half million people, the Danes boast that they are one of the greenest, richest and happiest nations on earth. Hang out, have fun, dance a bit, uh, laughing, making fun of each other most of the time. They may be in party mode, but 28-year-old Katrina Heilman and her Gen Y friends take climate change very seriously. For Katrina, it came down to a career choice between the stage and Denmark's burgeoning green industry. I wanted to be an actor, but... but uh, I figured that I would be better in, in physics. So, uh, so I found this education about uh, an energy engineer. So this is just another day at the office for you, eh? Ah, not quite, but... <laughs> <laughs> Katrina Heilman is part of the wind power revolution. As an engineer, she keeps the blades spinning. We head out of Copenhagen Harbour to Denmark's first offshore wind farm, built just nine years ago. Five and a half thousand wind turbines now arc across the country, generating 20% the nation's power. The target? An ambitious 50% in 15 years' time. Why build the, uh, the wind park offshore? Why not put them... Uh... Because uh, the energy in the wind uh, it's, uh, it's higher on, on, on sea than on land. The surface of the ocean is not disturbing the wind as much, so we can get more energy out of the wind. The 20 turbines generate 40 megawatts of power, enough electricity for 40,000 Copenhagen households. From water to the top, it's they are 102 meters high, up to the tip of the wing. I think it's beautiful. But where Katrina sees beauty and function, other Danes see a blight on the landscape. Another reason why the turbines are out here. People don't like a, a wind turbine in their backyard. Why not? Uh, they are noisy, as you can hear. They uh, are quite noisy. Yeah, it is, and uh, they're big and large and and. A lot of people don't find them very beautiful. And, uh, it's not big On the platform, we can see Sweden, just 20 kilometres away. We have put a lot of this is Sweden just over here. Yeah. And in the distance, we can see, what, two nuclear reactors. Yeah, called Basabeg. Yeah, but they close them down. But yeah. These Swedish reactors were mothballed after Danish government protests, but they were too close to Copenhagen. The Danes proudly proclaim a tough anti-nuclear stance. But the awkward fact is that 8% of Denmark's energy is imported nuclear power. That's not the only hypocrisy in Danish power politics. The other issue is the reliance on greenhouse gas emitting coal. The biggest problem with wind power is its unpredictability. And Denmark still relies on coal-fired power plants to generate half the country's energy. We need them uh, for uh, stability in the power system. And we need them for uh, if uh, suddenly the wind is, uh, is um, 
it's gone and then we don't have any power. So we need to run the, the power plants. But green activists violently disagree. They demand Denmark end its dependence on coal now. Their solution, a massive increase in wind farms and a cocktail of other renewables. Recently, 1,500 protesters marched on this Copenhagen coal-fired power station, intending to shut it down. The confrontation also served as a dress rehearsal for the climate change summit. Hey, 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 hey. Danish police displayed zero tolerance, arresting 177 protesters. And there was zero sympathy from the government. I think it's absolutely foolish to try to close down the electricity uh, consumption and energy uh, supply for a whole uh, capital. Uh, I don't accept that kind of things. And I mean, what was the message? That we should try to be more independent of coal. OK, that's not really a hard news. Everybody knows that. We're working hard to get it. Denmark's Minister for Climate and Energy, Connie Hedegaard, leads by example. There are no limos or bodyguards for this former TV journalist turned politician as she pedals between meetings and parliament, preparing to host the December summit. While much of the industrialised world now races to catch up with renewable energy, the Danes have been building that capacity for three decades. They were shocked into action by their vulnerability during the 1973 oil crisis. We were 99% dependent on fossil fuels imported from outside. And we had a crisis with the Middle East and we had to do something about it. So for more than 30 years now, we have had this focus on energy efficiency and on renewables in order to make people save energy, uh, but also in order to enhance our energy independency. Coal still dominates in Denmark's futuristic power stations. Despite this dependence, the government claims to have reduced the 1990 level carbon emissions by an impressive 14%. The Danes also achieved strong economic growth, while still consuming roughly the same amount of power as they did 20 years ago. But they're still burning coal. They're still burning coal. And of course, in Denmark, we do not expect ever to build more new coal-fired plants in Denmark. That is not sort of in the cards. But Greenpeace claims it's all a political con, that the national carbon targets will only be met by buying offshore credits, that the green Denmark brand is badly tarnished by coal. We have not much to brag about. I mean, we are a very heavily use of coal. If you don't get rid of that and show how to get rid of that, we, we have nothing to, to show to other countries. I mean, we are, uh, two years ago, we used more coal per capita than, we do, uh, than, than, than uh, the Chinese did. this vast factory, they can't turn out the massive wind turbine blades fast enough. The delicate finishing work is a frantic, women-only affair. The company believes men lack the aptitude for fine detail. A 
about 90% of production is exported. Denmark controls more than a third of the booming international wind turbine market, worth tens of billions of dollars, generating a huge green industry that didn't exist 25 years ago. Well, seeing that today we have uh, close to 30,000 jobs related to the wind industry in Denmark. Being green costs money, and lots of it. In September, the nation watched live on TV as Denmark's Crown Prince Frederick officially opened the $700 million Horns Reef offshore wind farm, the world's largest. Such projects are only possible due to government subsidies. Carbon taxes are now a hot political issue in many countries, but in Denmark, they've been a fact of life for years. Danes pay some of the highest taxes in the world. For many years we've had a CO2 tax. Even before Kyoto we had a CO2 tax in Denmark. So when I, back at home, get my electricity bill, I can see the CO2 tax. When I buy fuel for my car, more than half of the price will be taxes. So there is a very huge incentive for me, for my household, for me as a citizen, and for business to save energy. Beyond Copenhagen, across the wind-swept seas, other Danes are seeking alternative energy solutions. Samso Island is billed as Denmark's model renewable energy community. Carbon neutral, self-sufficient in electricity. It's a conservative place, very much in sync with the seasonal rhythms of rural life. Twelve years ago, Samso won a national contest to become Denmark's first government-assisted carbon-neutral community. At first, this island of 4,000 people seemed an unlikely bunch of environmentalists. You had a depression, actually, on the island when the project started. You had 100 jobs disappearing because the slaughterhouse was closing down. So maybe that was a good situation to come with a new project saying, do you want to participate in creating new jobs? Not uh, in Bangladesh or saving the polar bears in Greenland, but how to save this island? How can we save our local area? The islanders abandoned their dependence on imported oil and electricity. They formed energy co-ops. Wind turbines sprouted on land and sea and soon generated so much power, it was being exported back to the mainland. For dairy farmer Jörn Tranberg, the energy island concept is simply good business. Behind the milking shed, the new love of his life towers over the landscape. And, it, and it's a she. Yes, yeah. it's a she. Why? <laughs> I don't know why I call her uh, she. Maybe that's more nice than he. Well, it's, she's a very big she. Yeah. She's 50 metres high and yeah. the blades is 27. So how much, how much electricity does this produce? I'll produce two and a half million kilowatts. That's for 500 families. 500 families? Or 35 farms like me. From one turbine. At the top, the hatch folds back like the cargo bay of a strange rural space shuttle. Go! Oh. Wow, what a view. It's amazing. Jörn paid the equivalent of one and a quarter million dollars for his turbine and the spectacular view. That was nine years ago. OK. Oh, yes, now only five second meters. He's already got his investment back and makes $200,000 a year from the power he supplies to the grid. 
He says it's far more profitable than dairy farming. Do you think they're ugly? I hear a lot of people say they're, uh, they're ugly to look at, they make too much noise, they don't belong on farmland. What, what do you say? Oh, you see, there we can see uh, a place where they burn coal, and there we can see a place where they burn coal, and there we can see a place where they bur burn coal. What's most nice? There's no smoke up from wind turbines, you see. And the noise you have here by yourself, there's no noise about it. For Jern, the blades make the sweet, gentle sound of money. You certainly feel the power as the tower shudders with every rotation. Um, do you ever see yourself giving up the, the cows, the dairy farm, and just do this? Would you do that? Uh, I'm 55 now, and then I'm 60. I don't want to have cows more. And so maybe I will play golf and have wind turbines. Do you think that could be good? Back on terra firma, Jesper Kiem is busy selling Energy Island's biomass generators to the world. You actually just take the straw that was, was before it was burned on the field. It was uh, given to the animals. So when you have three kilos of straw, you have the same amount of energy as one kilo of oil. Yeah, right, and so people are growing much more straw no, they're really and they're burning it. Because Hundreds of diplomats, business people and journalists have made the pilgrimage to this high temple of green power. And all ask the same question. Can these local solutions work globally? A good example is we had the, the Egyptian ambassador visiting the island and he was asking, OK, I really like this project, it's nice, I, I'm, I'm impressed. How many people do you live here? Well, we are 4,000 people, I told him. Well, then he replied, that's, that's two blocks in Cairo. H how am I going to do this? And, well, it's, 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 a, it's a big project. But we told him, well, maybe you should start with the two blocks. You need a defined project. So start with those two blocks, make them 100% renewable. Maybe the next two blocks will follow. It's easy to dismiss this place as an energy theme park, a kind of Lego land for greenies. But maybe they're onto something here. Their philosophy, from small beginnings come great things. You can always look at it in a very depressed way and say, OK, we're just a small island, we can't save the world. But then you have to look at why we're doing it. We're not doing it to save the world. We're not doing it to save China. We're doing it to save our island. Back on the streets of Copenhagen, we find another solution to that great carbon emitter, the car. Jan Gell is an internationally renowned urban architect with a simple message, get a bike. From New York to Australia, he's now hot property, advising on how to unclog urban arteries. So how many kilometres of bike paths do you have here? There will be 350 kilometer in the city. Denmark's traditional cycling culture was being choked by cars until authorities finally got serious about bike lanes. The results are extraordinary. In the past decade, cyclist numbers have doubled. At the moment, we have 37% of everybody going to work and studies on their bikes. But the, the goal is, before 2015, to have half of everybody commuting to work on bicycles. And there's not a hardcore, lycra-clad mountain biker to be seen. Just commuters in street clothes, riding old-fashioned rattlers, who aren't at all deterred by the inclement Nordic weather. What's the motivation? Why should someone park the, leave the car at home and ride a bike in days like today where it's absolutely freezing? 
Oh, why why think, should they do that? You think it's freezing? We think it's a lovely autumn day. <laughs> but um, it's part of the policy to have a more lively city, a safer city, a more sustainable city, and a city offering more healthy lifestyles. But apparently Danes also like the feel of the wind in their hair. And being green has its limits. Authorities don't dare make helmets compulsory. If we make it compulsory, every third of all the bicyclists will not be bicycling. Because there are so many small trips where you wouldn't bother. There are so many young and beautiful girls who wouldn't, uh, who wouldn't like to, be, uh, to have a silly helmet on. The Climate and Energy Minister certainly feels the political wind in her hair. Hi, hi, Behind the wheel of a new electric car, she's got a reputation for being tough and relentlessly on message. Connie Heathergum is an oddity in the world of environmental politics. A minister in a conservative government, she's the driving force behind Denmark's green agenda, an area traditionally dominated by the left. I never understood, also back in the 70s and in the 80s, I did not understand why this should be a sort of a special, a special leftist issue. Of course it shouldn't be. And nobody sort of has sort of the right to mon monopolize this discussion. On the contrary, it's a huge advantage now that this agenda is also being embraced from business, from big business. Wonderful, wonderful Volkswagen's park, its friendly old girl of cars. Neath her tavern light on this merry night, let us drink and drink one now. In global politics, all roads now lead to Copenhagen. The city will soon host 192 countries for the United Nations-sponsored summit on climate change. Will Copenhagen become the byword for a political deal to slash greenhouse gas emissions? Or will this be an opportunity lost? A lot depends on whether the United States wants to play. And as host of the summit, the pressure will be on Connie Hedegaard to seal the deal. Actually, I believe that the biggest loser if we don't get this global framework, that would be American business. Why is that? Because China will do this no matter what, in her own way. China will be doing this and is already doing a lot of things. Europe is doing this. Japan has announced now, we are doing this no matter what. And out on the streets, there'll be tens of thousands of protesters warning that this may be the last chance to come to grips with global warming. And with Danish police now threatening demonstrators with 40 days jail, activists may find that Copenhagen isn't so wonderful after all.